First of all, the financial crisis, and I've been living through that financial crisis since uh, the beginning, because I was at that time uh, in the Commission. I really believe that the so-called euro crisis or the existential crisis of the euro is behind us. The euro is one of the two most important currencies in the world, together with the dollar, the US dollar. Indeed, we have seen the euro area expanding. Indeed, Grexit did not materialize. Let me just tell you this. In June 2012, I invited the European Commission the chief economists of the most important banks operating in Europe. Not only European banks, also American banks. And I've asked them two questions. It was a brainstorm that lasts more than three hours. I've asked them, how many of you believe that Greece will be with us by the end of this year as a member of the euro? We were in 2012. All of them, except one, said Greece will not be a member of the euro next year. And they were the chief economists. They were not the chairman. They were the <laughs> chief economists. So the real experts on the matter on markets, they were wrong. And by the way, that was not only those chief economists. It was the so-called common perception markets, as you remember, 2012. Greece will be out of the euro. Still, they are with us. My second question was, how many of you believe that the euro is going to survive the current crisis or it will be a fundamental <coughs> change the way it operates. It was 50-50, <coughs> that question, 50-50. Half of those chief economists said the euro will not be so able to survive the current crisis as it stands today. But basically, not only the euro survived, but today you have a larger <coughs> euro area than before. Today we have in the Eurozone, more countries than we had before in all the European Union the year I became president of the Commission, 2004. At that time we were 15 countries. Now in the Euro area we have 19 countries. So I think that's an important question to ask ourselves. So if an organization is declining, how is, how is it that it keeps enlarging? What happened in fact was that unprecedented crisis, financial and sovereign debt crisis, it in fact did not start in, in Europe, it started here in the United States. That crisis put a very important challenge to the European Union, namely in the euro, because our economic and monetary union was not complete and still is not complete. And so we had to create new instruments that we had not before. And we had to build the lifeboat in the middle of the storm, which I think you agree is a very comfortable position, a not very comfortable position to be. And in fact, we have created not only bailout programs, adjustment programs for countries that need it, from Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Spain also, for the banking sector. And let's not forget that at that time, the common perception, for instance, in Germany was that those bailouts were not possible, were not acceptable according to the rules. But we have done it. Not only have done it, that we have created a new instruments like the European Stability Mechanism, the kind of European IMF that has a fire, financial firepower of 700 billion euros that was built from scratch. And we have made new regulation and uh, supervision rules. More than 40 pieces of legislation were approved in record time. We have created new rules of governance for the euro area. I'm not going now into the jargon of the European community, but to describe them. And we have created a banking union with a single resolution mechanism and a single supervisory mechanism, something that most people considered impossible before the crisis. But the crisis made it necessary. And then we had something that is typical in European integration. It is the so-called spillover effect. The fact that you need some step forward demands another step. I remember when I put the, the proposal on the table, because as you know, in the European Union, the European Commission has the monopoly of the right of initiative. It's a commission that presents the legislation, but afterwards it has to be approved by the Council, where all the governments are represented, and most of them also by the European Parliament. And when I put forward the proposals for the banking union, some colleagues, some uh, heads of government told me, look, you cannot do it, because it's not in the treaty. I said, yes, you are right, it's not in the treaty. But to fulfill the goals of the treaty, we need a banking union. And now we have, it's not complete, but we have the basic principles and the instruments of the banking union with 
the powers of the European Central Bank of direct supervision of national banks. In some cases, the European Central Bank has more competencies than the Federal Reserve of the United States. So for those who say that the European Union is disappearing, it's a little bit strange that more powers, more competence have been given to the European level, not only to the European Commission in the governance of the euro area, but also to unprecedented powers and competence were given to the European Central Bank and also to the European Banking Authority. So my point is the following. Yes, we have been living through a very demanding crisis, but in a typically frustrating, progressive, incremental, sometimes fragmented way, it's the way the European Union works, we have been responding. The European Union transforms itself by adaptation, successive adaptation. 